Now we're working. Good morning. I'm sorry I'm running a little bit late here today. I got stopped in the hallway out there. Uh, today we're going to continue our study that we've been working on in Places of the Passion, and we find ourselves uh, today at Pilate's Judgment Hall. And so uh, the, uh, the theme verse for this particular study is from Matthew 27. They bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate, the governor. We open with prayer. Lord Jesus, although you had done no wrong, you allowed yourself to be unjustly condemned to death so that we might live. Help us faithfully to confess the truth of your identity and the joy of our salvation as you bore witness to the truth before Pilate. Lead us to walk with humble and repentant hearts through this Lenten season as we follow you to the cross. Amen. Amen. All right. So... um, what I want to begin with is um, <laughs> Judge Judy. I just wanted to, uh, to start by maybe having uh, a quick review of some unjust trials that have occurred of late. Can you think of any unjust trials that have occurred? Yeah, I know, it's a sort of a, I thought that when I put this slide together, and I'm like, this might be opening a big can of worms, right? Well, so that's a great question, and actually sort of fits the bill here. What does, what does human justice look like? Maybe let's go there instead. Law? Law? Flawed. Thank you. Sorry. I guess it's time for me to maybe check into hearing aid. You know, this last week, Concordia Plans mailed me something that said, hey, we've added hearing aids to your Concordia plan. <laughs> yeah, our, our present justice system, I mean, the, the general assessment of it would be that it is flawed. We live in an imperfect world, so we can expect a flawed justice system. Um, you know, when pastors ask questions, it's always like, hey, read my mind. Mm-hmm. Can you read my mind? And I want you to answer what I'm trying to ask you. Uh, what I was thinking when I said, hey, let's talk about our present justice system. A couple of quick thoughts on that. Um, you mentioned flawed. I would say it's imperfect. Um, it, I think it should strive for uh, balance and understanding I think part of its flaws, um, you're not asking for what I think necessarily, but I guess maybe what I, what I should say, rather than where I was going to go with some of this, is that what we want in our justice system is an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So you do the crime, you get the time. But the problem is, when we look at our justice system today, is that when you bring so many opinions into the mix, everybody has a different opinion about what the crime is. And thus, we have a different opinion about what the time that needs to be done because of the crime should be. Uh, And we could give scores of examples, and I don't want us to get lost in any of this, but I'll give you one example that's sort of, um, I guess, contemporary today, is, is some states are canceling all drug-related charges for people uh, that have marijuana charges against them. Because you're seeing marijuana get legalized in all these different states. So all of these people who have served time in prisons for drug offenses related to marijuana are being released because states have legalized marijuana now. Now, does that mean there was justice being served then, and it's not now? Does it mean that there was no justice then, and now we're finally seeing it? You see, that that's where a lot of different opinions enter into the mix. And this is the other point that I was going to make real quick at the beginning here. Um, when we talk about, when we use language, so this will tie back into a couple of weeks ago when I talked about communicating with people, and you may recall some of this process that I used where I talked about I have an image in my head and I want to communicate it to you. So what's the vehicle by which I communicate that image that's in my head to you? Language, words. 
I choose a word, I put, a wor- I put these words, I string them together in sentences, I utter these sentences, you receive these sentences, you have understandings of the meanings of these words, you deconstruct the sentences, and you get an image in your mind. And the hope is, is if we're doing this really well together, communicating really well together, that the image that I have in my mind is the same image that exists in your mind. Remember that conversation? It's why reading a book is a lot of fun, and then you go see the movie based on the book, and you go, that's not what I pictured at all. Because everybody has a different image, right? Based on the language or the reading of a book. Well, I had to bring that up to tell you the next thing that I want to think, or that I've been thinking with regard to judging and court, unjustness in courts. When we bandy about words like justice or righteousness, Um, especially when we use these words and apply them towards our God, the words always fall short. The words are incapable of fully describing what we mean. Why is that? Because we're stuck with language, right? Let me explain what I mean by that a little more fully. Um, If we say that we have... Uh, a justice system. I'm not talking about God here. I'm just talking about our justice system. What you acknowledged right away with your response was, our justice system is flawed. But wait a minute. I thought it was supposed to be just, not unjust. A, A flawed system puts it in the category or the camp of unjust. The problem is, is that the justice system, the court system, the understanding of how things work is a messy business. And it's fraught with difficulty, and the simple answer is sin. Sin has entered in, and it's created a flawed system. So we could talk about like the Derek Chauvin trial, and some people, perhaps former law enforcement gathered in the room or present law enforcement participating over the web. I worked as a state patrol chaplain. I know where, st- where uh, troopers and where LEOs stood on the issue. And in fact, I felt um, an extra degree of compassion for people that were willing to go put their lives on the line on the regular. Every day they dressed up for work could be their last day. And so to err on the side of self-preservation so that I could go home and have dinner with my family and my children at the end of the day after a shift at work, I sort of get that. But the problem is, is that when self-preservation comes at the expense of an unjust act, and I'm not judging what Chauvin did or not did, since I'm using that example, I was always willing to give more Uh, leniency to the law enforcement officer than to the person who is potentially breaking the law. But this side of heaven, we're always going to struggle with that stuff. And that's when we get to talking about God and applying language to God and talking about, well, God is just. Wait a minute. You know, then why do, why are there little babies born with congenital heart defects? If God is just and righteous and good, Why does he allow for bad things? And I don't want to go into that realm either, but right now, we can talk about that. We have before in here. But these are the problems that we have with language being applied towards scenarios or situations, is that the language doesn't always um, cover the whole thing. And that was much deeper than what we probably would have done if we'd have just asked for a couple of cases with Judge Judy. If you'd have simply said, well, there was a guy who uh, rented a house and his cat peed all over the couch in the house that he rented, and they went on Judge Judy, and Judge Judy didn't uh, rule in favor of the homeowner because she was a cat lover, well, that would be unjust, and that would have sufficed. Moving on. Oh, how did I go there? This is a, a statue of Pilate with Jesus. Thought it was kind of a neat picture. We want to read a little bit through here. I'll read this. Pontius Pilate became the prefect or governor of Judea in Palestine in 26 AD. Apparently, he governed the province well. Province well, but ten and a half years of uh, 
his rule were not without controversy. Early in his administration, Pilate brought into Jerusalem troops whose standards bore the image of Emperor Tiberius. The Jews were offended by this display of graven images, and they started a riot, and Pilate was forced to replace the troops with another cohort. Another riot began under Pilate's rule when it was rumored that he had stolen funds from the temple, which he hadn't, to build an aqueduct or water channel into Jerusalem. That particular riot resulted in bloodshed. In still another incident, Pilate dedicated a set of golden shields to the emperor. King Herod demanded that the shields be removed. Governors who ruled unwisely risked being recalled by the emperor, a potentially serious threat to both career and life. Or, if you don't spell check real well like me when I type this, serious threat to both career and life. So it's not surprising that when facing another potential riot with Jesus, as we read in Matthew 27, Pilate sentenced an innocent man, Jesus of Nazareth, to death by crucifixion. So Pilate would have been put into place by the emperor of Rome. That would have been how he had his jurisdiction over Jerusalem, but we also have the Jewish rulers who were in place in Jerusalem at the time. Pilate would have been in command of the armies, which thereby gave him command over the local Jewish rulers, even though they were the religious rulers of the day. And they had to sort of function together. Okay, So basically what you get with this sort of introductory business here is that Pilate um, was assigned this task of ruling and needed to do a, a, a good job of it, needed to keep things peaceable in his province that he was um, assigned to govern so that he could retain his position. What does that sound like? Doesn't that sound like our elected officials? Yeah. What I would suggest is that as we continue to consider our democratic process here in the United States, that you remember you are going to have what you consider to be unjust rulers over you. Right? Why is that? Because it's rule by majority, and that's even a question for many. Rule by majority means that you always have to please your constituency. You have to kowtow to the majority. Is the majority always right? No. This is Jesus' prayer in today's gospel reading that we're dealing with. We're going to live in a world that's difficult for us. And what do we long for? We long for a world that has true justice and true righteousness. Where do we find that? With God. Doing things the way God orders them and deems them. Okay? Are we going to have it in this world? No and no surprise. Get over it. It's like we tell the kids. What do we tell them? Well, yeah, life, that's one of them. What's the one about fits? Kids? Throwing fits? They're not going to answer now. You get what you get and you don't throw a fit. (laughs) They know it still. You just got to coax it out of them a little bit. Okay? Through Roman and Jewish political conflicts, mob action, fears over the possible loss of a political career, Hmm. and unjust condemnation, God was at work. This is the thing we got to remember. You don't like how things are going? You get what you get. You don't throw a fit. We We have laws and legal means by achieving ends, but we can't flex our legal power or prowess in the hopes of forcing our agenda, whatever that may be. We have to trust in the middle of it that God is at work, for through the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, God would, from Colossians 1, reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Remember today's gospel lesson is Jesus praying the high priestly prayer just before going to the cross and making an other world, the one like which we long for, 
possible for us. Okay? That's the key. In Christ, the kingdom has come, we recognize it, and we live as citizens of that kingdom. This is why I don't get all in a tiz about stuff, because is there going to be strife and difficulty in this world? Yeah. It, now, there are things that are unjust. I mean, I'll give you a, a great example from pastor's conference last week. There's a bill that's passed through the Senate, and it's sitting at the House right now, as I understand it, called the Equality Act, that may have impact on us as a church because we have a food bank. Now, we did some just a little bit of background work on it at the pastor's conference, but can't do much because this act is not in its final form, so it's sort of sort of fruitless to talk about it at the present, but basically, <clears throat> I'll give you a quick example of how it might work and be applied to us as was first shared with me at the pastor's conference. We have the Equality Act. We have a food bank. We can't refuse service to people who use our food bank and need you know, goods, food goods. We can't refuse people on the basis of gender, uh, sexual orientation, uh, color, race, any of those things, right? Makes sense. We want to serve everybody that we can through the food bank. But because it's Redeemer Lutheran Food Bank, the laws that govern Redeemer Lutheran Food Bank under the Equality Act then are automatically applicable to us as Redeemer Lutheran Church. See what that means? Now, let's say, for instance, you get a same-sex couple that comes to the church and says, Pastor McReynolds, you're going to marry us. And because you're under the Equality Act, you have to. That doesn't square with our theology. You see? So what do we do in a case like that? That seems unjust to us because that's telling our religion, telling our faith, telling our church body what we have to do. We have legal means, and we're exercising legal means to fight the present form of the Equality Act. But these are the challenges that we operate under today, right? We live in a society that is, you know, I always say you can't legislate stupidity. That's what we try and do. So anyway, better get off my soapbox and get back on track. Yes. Yes. Ron. Yeah. Now, now we've got to change that law to make, you know, and then we'll pull the plug. Now we've got to change it again. Unintended consequences. Yeah. Yeah, Ron says, you know, you can't legislate morality because every time you create a new law, then you, you add problems down the line that you hadn't considered at the time of the writing of the law, which leaves us with unintended consequences of said law. And, and um, see, this is why... <laughs> This is why the law has been superseded by the gospel. See where I went with that? Jesus, the gospel, the world that he exposes to us, God's world is the one that we fix our eyes on. And we wait for it, as St. Paul writes in Romans 8, with hope. Right? Eager anticipation and hope. So, a little slide, what is truth? We're going to get that very familiar story. Luke 23. Then the whole company of them arose, brought Jesus before Pilate. They began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And Pilate asked him, Are you king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they were urgent, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea from Galilee, even to this place. So a question on the basis of that. What are the accusations brought against Jesus? I'll back up so we have it in front of us. What are the accusations? Yeah, so we found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar. Now, the claim that he was God... That accusation was brought before the Sanhedrin. 
That's the argument against Jesus at that particular trial because that would have had the most resonance with the Sanhedrin because now he's blaspheming to the religious leaders claiming to be God. Pilate could give a hoot about that. What's the argument here? It does say he's claiming to be Christ, a king, but this is the real argument. He's failing to give tribute to Caesar, and he's claiming kingship. Who's the real king in Pilate's, wa- in Pilate's world? Caesar is. The emperor of Rome is, because they're the ones who've exerted the military power over Jerusalem, over Judea. Right? So, and in order of that, emperor of Rome, Pilate as his assigned leader of that location. They could care less if he claimed to be God. But if you're claiming to be a king who has territorial reign over what the emperor or the empire of Rome has already conquered, then get ready to face the Roman army. You with me? That's the claim. So you're right, they did say that, but that wouldn't have been the charge that would have been, you know, would have piqued Pilate's interest, to put it in that way. What would have piqued Pilate's interest is that he's claiming to be a king. So that's why you see the question that he asked him in return. Are you the king of the Jews? This is what I find sort of interesting in this passage, given what I just told you. Jesus says, you've said so. Pilate said to the chief priests in the crowds, what? I find no guilt. Wait a minute. He just said, sort of. You see, that's what's interesting about Jesus' answer. Did he say, did Jesus himself say he was a king? No, he said, Pilate, you have said so. Sort of a slick way of getting around it. I, wouldn't, uh, I probably wouldn't manage well in that court. <laughs> I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. But Jesus is God, and Jesus knew the right answer to give. And the fact, I think that's what's connected to Jesus' response there. Or, I mean, Pilate's response there. Jesus said, you've said so. I didn't say it. And so Pilate, I find no guilt in this man. Tracking on that? Okay. We're going to look at two more passages, Matthew 27. So that was the Lucan version, just by the way. Someday, maybe, I don't know, if I start it, we'll never finish it. Like, I'll work until my retirement. But someday, maybe, I'll take you down the path that I did with the mission church that we did so long ago, where we did a parallel study of the Gospels. Because you got four different Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all of which contain some similarity, some differences. And it's kind of fun to read through the chronological parallels of the Gospels together. So we've read it in Luke here. Now we're going to go see it. How does Matthew tell the story? Because it's going to look a little different. (laughs) There's one in every crowd. Matthew 27, now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, you have said so. So far, sounds pretty good. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Yes. Jim says, that's not how the NIV reads. This is the ESV that we're looking at. He says, yes, it is as you say. So I'll settle this right now, and we'll go right to the Greek. Give me the verse, Jim, so I can shortcut this a little bit. Matthew 27, verse 11. And I'm going to the Greek. The affirmative yes is not a part of the Greek. Here's the reason they do this. Uh, this, You're seeing right there, remember when we started all these Bible studies and I talked about the Word, we did the whole study on the Word, and I said everything that we have nowadays is a translation. Uh, When I was in seminary, when we'd have to translate a Greek text into English, 
If we sort of mangled it a little bit, our professors would say, oh, you really NIV'd that one. (laughs) Here's the thing with the NIV that we talked about before, but I'll give you a quick reminder of. If you read the, the translator's preface at the beginning of the NIV, the goal of the committee that translated the Greek into what you now know of as the NIV had a goal of making it a very readable, easily flowing prose version of the Bible. In doing so, they took some creative license. The Greek, you can't make mistakes. It is what it is. So when you look at the Greek where I say it doesn't say Jesus acknowledged and says yes, there is no time in the Greek where Jesus said, yes, I am. He didn't acknowledge it. The Greek reads as you see it here, you have said so. The word is uh, su for you. Yeah, su ai ho basileos ton eudeon. You have said so. Su is is the Greek word. So it says you have said so. It doesn't say yes. So does that settle it? That's the long answer. Yeah, Sue, that's thou sayest. Yep. Now, here's another interesting side note, is that the King James Version is written on what's called the Textus Receptus, which is a a bit of a slightly different basis Greek text than the NA 2728 upon which ESV is written. Okay? Not wrong. We're, uh, We're dicing up some details here, but that's good. Okay? Then we're also supposed to read Isaiah 53. You know this one, he was oppressed, afflicted, yet opened not his mouth. So let me ask you, before I read on, uh, well, I'll finish this. Like a lamb that's led to the slaughter and a sheep that's before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people? Matthew's version looks different than Luke's version of the story because what's the detail Matthew gives us in his version that Luke didn't? Jesus' silence. You guys were doing it. (laughs) Your silence, I know you answered correctly because you were all silent. (laughs) So when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer a second time, not even to a single charge. Luke doesn't tell us that Jesus remained silent after that. We go back to Luke. So Luke says, Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, you've said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and crowds, I find no guilt. They were urgent. He stirs up the people, teaching throughout Judea, even from Galilee to this place. Not a word about Jesus remaining silent. I'm going to clue you in. This is not in the study. This is just because I know that this is going on here. I've told you this before. I'll keep telling you this all the time because I'll forget who I told it to, so I just keep telling you. And then I repeat myself, and then eventually you guys get it like I got it. Okay? Matthew, amongst scholarly circles, is often considered to have been one time a rabbi, a teacher of the people of Israel, but for some reason disgraced and removed from his high authoritative position as a teacher. Now disgraced, he serves as what's his present vocation at the time of the writing of the gospel tax collector, enemy of the Jewish people. Why? Well, that's where we get the disgraced business, but why do we think he was a rabbi? Because Matthew goes to great lengths in his gospel account of Jesus to tie Old Testament prophecies about Jesus to the man himself. There are more Old Testament quotations found in the Gospel of Matthew than any of the other Gospels combined. And Matthew always takes effort to connect them to Jesus. So 
When Matthew writes, even the account of Jesus' time before Pilate, he doesn't quote from Isaiah 53. Not directly anyway, but look at the detail that he gives us. Jesus gave Pilate no answer. Why would Matthew include this detail? Because Matthew knew Isaiah, the prophet. And Matthew knew that the one who was the Christ, Isaiah wrote about him and said he was oppressed, he was afflicted, he opened not his mouth. Does that mean Jesus was actually silent before Pilate? I think so. And I think Matthew had the presence of mind guided by God's Holy Spirit and his training to make that connection subtle as it may be. Any of you have, I don't have my study Bible open. Any of you have a study Bible open looking at the Matthew text where it says he gave him no answer? That'd be verse 14. Look in the margin and see, does it have a cross-reference to Isaiah 53? Or am I just super brilliant and displaying that brilliance in front of you right now? Someone's going to say, no, it's there. Okay, nobody's calling it out, so I'll check it. You're afraid to tell me that I'm not brilliant, aren't you? Don't be afraid. Everybody tells me, <laughs> yeah, how did I know? That, hap- that, that fourth of the room over there would be quick to remind me that I am not brilliant. Matthew 27, 14. Patsy, I didn't mean to include you with that crew. I know you think I'm brilliant, Patsy. <laughs> I'm kidding. There are no verse notes on verse 14. But not in verse 14. There are no margin notes in 27. Bow down in the presence of greatness. <laughs> I take that back. He must increase, I must decrease. What's the big deal here? It's about Jesus as the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy as taught by Matthew subtly and only repeated by dumb old Pastor McReynolds. There you go. How does Jesus fulfill Isaiah's prophecy? We've been talking about that. His silence, right? He's silent before his accuser. How are the accusations in Pilate's judgment hall different? We kind of talked about that a little bit too. Different charges. He's claiming to be a king in in Pilate's judgment hall versus the judgment that was brought against him with the Sanhedrin, which was he's claiming to be God. Two different charges. Now, isn't that the definition of an unjust trial? They already knew what their outcome was going to be. But they're altering, uh, one of my former pastor colleagues back in the Nebraska district used to say this, no lawyer will ask a question in court that he doesn't already know the answer to. So you ask a question that you know the answer to, you can lead where you want to go. That's like pastor asking you guys, read my mind. I'm not a lawyer, okay? Okay but I stayed at a Holiday Inn this last week. I'm not a lawyer, but I know the question to ask, and they knew the questions to ask because that would lead the conclusion of the courts, the separate courts, to arrive at the same conclusion, which was, this man is deserving of death. Okay? So why are these new charges more effective? We've talked about that. Why would Pilate be concerned about the fact that Jesus' teachings were stirring up the people? Yeah, they got to keep the peace. If things get out of hand under Pilate's rule, then what kind of ruler is he? Unfit. And what's Caesar going to do with him? You're done. I, uh, in 1990, stayed in, um, well, I went to Oxford for my senior thesis of my undergraduate degree, but we traveled around and went to Rome. And just outside, I visited the Colosseum. I'm on video, so I won't tell you the whole story there. 
And right outside the Colosseum are the courts where Caesar and the courtyard, like the gardens, where Caesar would stay, right near the Colosseum. And um, you know, it said Emperor Nero in 60 AD was a hardcore persecutor of Christians. They would round up the Christians and they would kill them in all kinds of different ways, use them in the, um, in the Colosseum itself, feed them to the lions, you know, like stuff like that for people's, you know, spectacle. But he would take Christians and he would light them on fire and let them run through his gardens at night so that he could see them as they were running and dying and burning to light up his gardens. It was a, a brutal time. Huh, that kind of stuff went on too, right? Uh, you know, but there, see, doesn't that sound like justice, by the way? You didn't mean to do that, but doesn't that sound like justice to us? Hey, he killed other people. Why didn't someone kill him? But in the midst of all this, there's some really cool things that came out of it. Like uh, one of the first readings I did in a Christian history class at seminary was written by a young woman named Perpetua. And we have a, a celebration in the Christian calendar, the Feast of Perpetua. The young lady who confessed Christ, though she was being given over to be sacrificed to the lions. And her father came and pled with her. She had a little one at home, I think one on the way, if I remember the reading right. And her father came and begged her, renounce Christ so they let you go. And it's a writing of all this, and she wouldn't do it. And they fed her to the lions. So if you ever heard that name or seen it on a Christian calendar, Perpetua, now you sort of know what that means. And if you want to do some reading, like some direct reading on that, I think I have a book, it's called uh, Readings in Christian Thought, that I read at a history class. But, you know, people, it, it's just as seems to me to that the people that exact these heinous crimes against people should be paid back. What does our God say about that? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. You don't like how things are? You get what you get? You don't throw a fit? Let God handle it. I mean, that's so, it's so much easier. It takes so much stress off of your shoulders. And, uh, you know, I've used this term before, too, several times in the last week, even. We live in a time of what I call recreational outrage. We're just looking for something to get upset about. Woo! Like, that makes us feel good to have some recreational outrage about this. Hey, did you hear about that on the news? Oh, yeah, I did. That makes me angry. Yesterday, uh, we drove to uh, Springfield with my little red car, and I sold it to a guy. I know. I know. But in the last 20 minutes while I was in the car, we stopped at Bed Bath & Beyond. Amy was in the van beside me, and we drove from there to go meet the guy at a Brahms. He wanted a burger there. He likes burgers. And we're driving across the intersection, and Amy didn't see this, nor did the kids, because they were up in front of me. And she had gotten into the turn lane to take a right turn, and I was in the go-through straight lane, and she was supposed to be in the go-through straight lane. So she was sitting in the turn lane with her right turn signal to cut back in front of me, and I stayed back so she could cut back in front of me. Remember this? The light, for the arrow for her to turn, turned, and the light for me turned. My line of traffic hadn't moved yet. Her line of traffic was moving, and the guy who was right next to me, behind her, so there I was in my little red car. What do you suppose I did? <laughs> this was the look on my face. And I'm like, what? That's what I did. And then he turned and he said, what? And then he said, go Big Red, you're number one. That's not what he said, but he said it to me. He told me I was number one. But I was angry about it. I mean, look at that. How quickly we get angry. And I want to ex- follow him around the corner instead of following my wife. And I can still catch up to her and meet her at Brahms and still get the car sold. I had one last hurrah where you can't follow me by the car anymore, buddy. 
But we get that way. You know, we're outraged. Things are bad. We want to be angry. This guy wanted to be angry at me. And in the instant, I wanted to be angry at him because, and what's the big deal? We're just driving. Who cares? But I want to be outraged in this moment. Yeah. And it can get people in trouble doing stuff like that. Back on track. This is an interesting uh, mural that was uncovered archaeologically, this piece of art that I found. You see what's going on in this? This is terrible, isn't it? It's like they're flinging a baby here. This is Pilate. This is a, this is a, why can't I come up with the word? You know, where they take little tiles. Some of the artists, help me, Joyce. They take the tiles. Mosaic, thank you. Holy cow. i got to get my words moving again. It's a mosaic that was uncovered archaeologically that shows this, that depicts this scene with Pilate ruling. I don't remember all the context of it, but I, I was searching. I like to search for things, artwork, and things that sort of depict some of this when I've been putting these slides together. Um, when Pilate heard this, we're back to Luke. He asked whether the man was a Galilean, Jesus. When he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself. Oh, this, this was Herod. That was King Herod on the right there in his court. Because I just searched King Herod, and this is the image that was portrayed that had been found in antiquity of King Herod there on the right. Uh, back to the text. Um, Jesus was sent over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at the time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was glad, for he had long desired to see him because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. This is not the same King Herod that was responsible. That's what this picture is. King Herod Agrippa was the one responsible for the slaughter of the innocents. That's what you're seeing right here. So remember, King Herod Agrippa had heard that Jesus was born, ascertained this from the wise men, and went and killed the babies that were born in Bethlehem at that time. It's thought to be between six and a dozen, just given the, the numbers of people that lived in the area at that time. But that's also a commemoration in the Christian calendar, is the slaughter of the innocents. That's what this is. The Herod that's ruling at the time of Jesus now is his son. Okay. Herod had heard about him. He was hoping to see some sign done by him, so he questioned at some length, but he made no answer. Jesus still remained silent. Now Luke gives us that detail. The chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him, and Herod, with his soldiers, treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then, arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate, and Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day. For before this, they had been at enmity with one another. So they bonded over the persecution of Jesus, who was a king that challenged Herod, and Pilate, who was son of God that challenged the chief priests and the rulers. You see what happens when mob rule becomes the most important thing, and all you're looking to do is just quell the mob? Innocent people die. In this case, Jesus. So why does Pilate send Jesus to Herod? What's the reason? I'm sorry. He wants to wash his hands of him. He wants to, I'm sorry, I'm just having trouble hearing it once more than once. I ask for the questions to be answered, you answer them, and then I can't hold my end of the bargain up. Sorry. Yeah, the, he wants to take care of it. I find no guilt in this man, I'm washing my hands. Maybe you'll find some something wrong here that you can rule against. And Herod, have you guys seen uh, The Passion of the Christ, Mel Gibson's version of this? I like how Herod is portrayed in that. A little bit kind of crazy, you know? And he wants Jesus to perform some tricks for him and stuff. You know, I, I think it sort of fits what we know about him from antiquity, what's been recorded about him. Now, this is Herod Antipas, son of Herod the Great. I got him backwards who ordered the slaughter of the infants of Bethlehem at the time of Jesus' birth. Um, what had Herod once thought of Jesus? We're going to look at Matthew 14, verses 1 and 2. 
At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus, and he said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He's been raised from the dead. That's why these miraculous powers are at work in him. Do you remember the rest of that story? What did Herod the Tetrarch then do with John the Baptist? Cut his head off. So you know the setting of that story is he had taken his brother's wife and John spoke God's word into that. John said, "Uh, can't do that. That's an adulterous relationship. Herod, the Tetrarch, didn't take kindly to being told what to do. So, after Herodias, his daughter, had danced for him, he was so taken by this that he said, ask for anything and it shall be given to you. Herodias, his then wife, said, ask for the head of John the Baptist. On a platter. That means it's always going to end well for Christians. Remember that. It's not always going to end well for Christians, guys. We've got to remember that. We may be treated what we understand to be unjustly, with difficulty, with trouble in this world, but our Lord has equipped us with eyes on another world, His world where justice and righteousness reigns and prevails and He is the King and the ruler over all. And that's what we fix our eyes and our sights on. So what's the result of Jesus' hearing before Herod? Really no result when it comes to Jesus. The result we see is that Herod and Pilate become buddies. That's really the the biggest result that we see. What does Herod do to mock Jesus' claims? Yep, dresses him up in regal clothing. Um, Do you guys know why we use purple during the season of Lent? Purple was the sign of royalty. It was rare, and it's a beautiful color because it was our wedding color. But it's a royal color that was reserved for royalty, so Herod dresses him up in royal, regal uh, clothing, and then they give him a crown of thorns and they punish him. They continue his punishment. We put purple on the altar. The pastor wears a purple stole during the season of Lent because it's a reminder of Jesus' royalty and what happened to him. See, that, that's one of the things I love about our liturgical forms and the things that we do in church that have meaning that goes back sometimes beyond our even capability of understanding it. You know, if we go to a more modern form of worship, sometimes what happens is when you chuck out the bath water, the baby goes with it. You know? And, and uh, oh, we're going to do all modern worship and we're going to sing seven modern songs and this guy's going to get up and preach to us in a, uh, you know, in jeans and, um, and a hoodie. And he's just a regular guy like the rest of us. Is that valid? It is, but is that helpful? Possibly, I think we'd be better, this is just me, I think we'd be better equipping people with why do we do the things that we do? Why do we use purple during the season of Lent, a 40-day season of Lent? Because it prepares us for the passion of our Lord who was put to death after being mocked for being a king when in reality he is a king. A couple years ago, oh my goodness, why did I look at my watch? I'd better just stop. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, let's finish the questions on this one and then we can pick up after this. Jesus once said of Herod, go and tell John Fox, behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow and the third day I finish my course, Luke 12, 32. Now Jesus is standing before Herod the very one he said these words to. Sorry, John, I was just seeing if you're paying attention. Now Jesus is standing right there in front of the guy who was trying to get a hold of him earlier. Right? He's very near the end of his course. Did Jesus know it at the time he said that to Herod? Absolutely he did. All right, we're going to pause right there. That's a good stopping point.
That's Jesus back in front of Pilate, another artwork that we see there. So, All right, any residual questions before we come back? This is why we can't ever get through this stuff, right? All right, let's, uh, let's close with a quick word of prayer. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the eyes of faith that you have equipped us with to see through the unjust things of this world. Even as your son was treated unjustly, Lord, help us to remain faithful like him. Perhaps even, Lord, keeping our own mouths shut in the face of these injustices and enduring them just as your son endured them, trusting ourselves or trusting in trusting ourselves totally to your protection and care and understanding, Lord, that you have more better and bigger that you have to give to us. It's only on account of Jesus who has won these things for us, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a blessed day and week. Look forward to seeing you the next time when we hopefully wrap this one up. We did pretty good today.